the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be sharing my time with the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in the budget and in the limited time I have available. I'm going to focus on three areas. I'm going to talk about what we're doing in research and development, Mr. Speaker. Also, uh, what we're planning to do with infrastructure and transportation, because that's a critical uh, element of the budget for all of us in Canadians, and especially in my city of Toronto. And uh, finally, I'd like to talk about the need and the, uh, the plan to return to balanced budgets. So first of all, when it comes to research and innovation, Mr. Speaker, I don't need to convince you, Mr. Speaker, that uh, research and innovation are key to building a 21st century economy. It's a way to develop differentiated products and services. It drives productivity. It drives long-term sustainable competitive advantage. And that's how we're going to compete on the world stage as a country. We want Canada to be a country where the best and brightest from around the world come to Canada and they innovate and they showcase their talent and then they can enjoy the benefits of their hard work, their dedication and their creativity. When we support innovation, our businesses continue to fuel job creation and economic growth in Canada. An Economic Action Plan 2014 introduces many new measures to support risk-taking, entrepreneurship and innovation. The first one I'm going to mention, Mr. Speaker, is the Canada First Research Excellence Fund with $1.5 billion over the next 10 years. Now, this is a really important measure, Mr. Speaker. It builds Canadian leadership in science and innovation, and it's working through our world-class post-secondary institutions. Another important uh, pillar of our research and innovation agenda, Mr. Speaker, is continued support to advance uh, scientific research granting councils. So there's $46 million in new annual funding for organizations like the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, also the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and I should mention also the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Another very important item in this budget, Mr. Speaker, is the announcement of $222 million in funding for the Triumph Physics Laboratory, which supports leading research and also launches cutting-edge spin-off companies. I should mention the support for the Institute of Quantum Computing, which is really some leading-edge research that's being done in the field of quantum technologies. There's $15 million allocated for that. And then another initiative, which I'm very close to through my work that I do with the Government Operations and Estimates Committee, is the creation of the Open Data Institute, which has all kinds of opportunities for using government data to create, uh, create businesses and, and, and startups and, and provide good services to Canadians. Ongoing and continued now is $500 million over two years for the Automotive Innovation Fund, which is really critical for replatforming and for leading Can Canadian and Ontario-based uh, automotive industries into the 21st century. And uh, also very important all across the country is $90 million in the Forest Industry Transformation Program to advance new technologies in Canada's wood products and also the pulp and paper sectors. Economic Action Plan 2014 plans to reduce interprovincial trade barriers, which is really important. We can have great products and services, but we need to be able to sell these things across Canada. And that same thinking, Mr. Speaker, applies to our plan to uh, launch campaigns to promote high quality and high value Canadian made products around the world, which is very aligned with our very ambitious and very successful trade agenda. So all these new markets that are opening up for us because of our trade agreements with Europe, around the Americas and now into Asia, will be uh, leveraging some of the developments we have through R&D. You know, in these research and innovation measures, it's not a new thing. We're building on some of the past successes. I should mention, Mr. Speaker, that since 2006, we've, uh, we've provided over $2 billion for universities and colleges for construction and repairs through the Knowledge Infrastructure Program, and also $2.3 billion to support advanced research through the federal granting councils. And then it was also $800 million to support post-secondary research through the Canada Foundation for Innovation. All these measures, Mr. Speaker, add up to a strong support for the, uh, the R&D space in Canada. I should mention one specific one, which is $1.5 billion to support private sector R&D in Canada's aerospace sector through the Strategic Aerospace and Defence Initiative. And uh, last year, you might recall, Mr. Speaker, we launched the Venture Capital Action Plan to increase private sector investment in early stage companies. So Canadians are innovators. We have been throughout our history and we can compete with anybody around the world. Economic Action Plan 2014 gives them that shot in the arm they need to succeed around the world. Uh, the second item I want to talk about, Mr. Speaker, is infrastructure and transportation. One of the most common conversations I have in my constituency office and with constituents in Etobicoke Lakeshore is the need 
for the City of Toronto and other cities in Canada, but especially in Toronto, to build more infrastructure, to get people moving, to get goods moving, and to help uh, build the foundation for a strong economy. In 2007, we launched the $33 billion Building Canada Plan, which supported over 12,000 infrastructure projects across Canada. And of course, you know, Mr. Speaker, in 2008 and 2009, in the stimulus phase of Canada's Economic Action Plan, we supported an additional 30,000 infrastructure projects across Canada. And in 2013, we announced a new Building Canada Plan, even bigger and even longer, a $53 billion investment in predictable infrastructure funding over 10 years, which is the largest and longest federal investment in job-creating infrastructure in Canadian history. And since 2006, I should add, uh, when I talk about the Greater Toronto Area, we've invested $4.5 billion in GTA infrastructure in major projects like the York Spadina subway extension, we've uh, enhanced the GO Transit, and we've also uh, invested in the revitalization of Union Station. Now we're going to support Toronto with its plans to uh, bring much needed mass transit to Scarborough. Economic Action Plan maintains these promises of the new Building Canada Plan and delivers new measures that benefit Canadians from coast to coast to coast, including $40 million to accelerate repair and maintenance of small craft harbours and a $200 million fund to establish a national disaster mitigation program. I'd be remiss, Mr. Speaker, if I didn't mention how we provided increased and ongoing support through the gas tax fund, first doubling its size to $2 billion per year, making it permanent, and indexing it at 2% per year beginning this year. In housing, which is mentioned by some members in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, we invested over $1 billion since 2006 for renovations and energy retrofits for close to 200,000 affordable housing units. And we've invested $600 million in the homelessness partnering strategy and over $1.25 billion in the investment in an affordable housing program to help those Canadians in need find and keep affordable housing. These long-term investments, Mr. Speaker, in our roads, subways, railways, bridges, harbours, and other critical infrastructure are key to keeping Canadians moving and maintaining our quality of life and our prosperity. We benefit from these investments, and I especially feel it because it reduces our commuting time so families can spend more time together. Let me talk, why these, let me talk about why these things are important, Mr. Speaker, when we, uh, in the context of returning to balanced budgets. You know, prior to the global recession, our Conservative government paid down $37 billion in debt, bringing Canada's debt-to-GDP ratio to its lowest level in nearly 30 years. This placed Canada in a strong fiscal position to weather the global recession. When the recession hit, we made a deliberate decision to run temporary deficits by generating economic stimulus through our infrastructure program. We also decided to leave money in taxpayers' pockets. We lowered taxes, despite opposition howls to maintain them and even raise them. This gave Canadians more money to spend and kept the economy going. Conservatives know you cannot tax your way out of a recession. We've cut taxes over 150 times reducing the overall tax burden to its lowest level in 50 years. That's fantastic. We've cut federal taxes in every way governments collect them. We've cut personal taxes, we've cut consumption taxes, we've cut business taxes, we've cut excise taxes, we've cut duties, we've cut many more. Our record of strong tax relief saves a typical family of four in Canada $3,400 a year. It's unbelievable. In addition to lowering taxes for Canadian families, we've lowered taxes for seniors and low-income Canadians. By increasing the amount Canadians can earn without paying taxes, by increasing the age credit and the pension income credit, we've removed over one million dollars, one, one million low-income Canadians from the tax rolls altogether. Part of our plan to balance the budget is to control the federal government costs, including public sector compensation and departmental expense. We need to ensure compensation and benefits are fair and in line with those of other public and private sector employees. I should mention, Mr. Speaker, that unlike the previous Liberal government, our deficit reduction plan does not include cutting transfers to the provinces. So the benefits of a strong fiscal position, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't need to convince you. I know you understand the importance of having lower borrowing costs, our AAA credit rating, the only G7 country to have that AAA credit, credit rating from Moody's, Fitch and Standard & Poor's. All the measures in Economic Action Plan 2014 lead to a hander, higher standard of living and we avoid burdening our children and our grandchildren with our debts. Future, the future is bright for Canada, Mr. Speaker, and I strongly suggest that all members of this House support this budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, questions and comments, Honourable Member for Ottawa Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank uh, the Parliamentary Secretary for his, uh, his comments, and he certainly gave a great resume of uh, uh, the Conservative government's uh, perception of how things are going. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things is that he left out is the, you know, t all these tax cuts he mentioned. One of the dilemmas that the government has, though, is the astronomical household debt. We put forward some very practical solutions to help everyday Canadians. In fact, some of them were adopted in their speech from the throne, but somehow disappeared by the time they got to the budget. So I'd like to know what happened there. The other issue, of course, is when we look at youth, um, you know, this loans for apprentices is, is, is not going to help. If you actually talk to like my friend who's actually gone through the trades uh, from Winnipeg Centre, he'll tell you, you know, that's just more debt burden Back to my original point about household debt, it's not going to help when we're hearing that. You need to do more to help people get to the apprentices and then get to the jobs. And finally, if this government's serious about, you know, going forward, they have to be coherent. And I just would like to know what his opinion is on income splitting. Is he with his finance minister on this or is he with his prime minister on this? Where does he stand? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, three questions rolled into one. I'll try and uh, answer them as briefly as I can so other members have the opportunity to ask questions also. Uh, his first uh, question had to do with household debt. And you know, there's only, if you actually look at and you would do some analysis, you realize that not only is Canadians' household debt increasing, but Canadians' net worth is also increasing. So what's happening is people are borrowing against their net worth. And so in and of itself, household debt is not a problem. You have to get down into the layers and look at what kinds of people are borrowing and inappropriately. And that's why we put in some measures with respect to, uh, to credit cards, and we've put in other measures with respect to, uh, to borrowing. Uh, ultimately, though, this is a vote of confidence. People are borrowing, especially if you think of young people who buy homes, and part of that debt is their mortgages, because the, they have the confidence in the Canadian economy, they know they can buy those homes and meet those mortgage payments. So I think uh, my, uh, my friend uh, in, in the opposition is, uh, is, is, is building a solution for a problem that doesn't quite exist in the way he thinks. The second uh, question, if I, uh, if I recall, has to do with uh, training. And I know we need to leave some time for other, other members, but I'll just say that our, our job plan, the Canada Job Grant, is really important. There's a lot of jobs out there, thousands of jobs out there that are unfilled. And this is where the job grant really comes in. And uh, I know that I've had many discussions with our Minister of Human Resources. We're committed to getting people into those jobs that they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, colleague uh, uh, from the Conservative Party mentioned the uh, Venture Capital Action Plan, uh, which was announced in last year's uh, budget. And um, I was looking at the, uh, the description of the uh, funds that they would be investing in, and I read the words, uh, invest primarily in Canada-focused funds. So that's not uh, investing exclusively uh, in getting uh, Canadian discoveries uh, uh, commercialized. Uh, I'm wondering if the member is concerned about that and if, if uh, he might be able to quantify uh, the government's thinking uh, in terms of what qualifies as uh, sufficient Canadian content uh, for these uh, venture capital funds that we're investing taxpayers' money in. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, you know, it is the 21st century, Mr. Speaker, and the, uh, when it comes to capital and ideas and intellectual property, they do travel around the world. So to try and, and, and narrow down, uh, you know, what numbers of uh, investors, what number of ideas, and who participates on teams that create these ideas, it's, it's really besides the point. There are Canadian-based institutions that do this research and development, and that's who we're trying to promote. Uh, and I thank the member for his comments about commercialization because that's an important piece and we've made a lot of investments when it comes to commercialization to make sure that these kinds of ideas actually have real markets and uh, that's the next hurdle that many of these companies need to go through to make sure that these products are really uh, fitting the needs for markets that are out there around the world. Uh, just while I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, I'm just going to make one comment about income splitting because my my, my, my friend brought it up because it just goes to show how little they have to criticize this budget when they don't want to talk about this budget and they want to talk about the budget in 2015. So I think uh, give my friend some time in 2015. In the meantime, I'm, re I'm very proud of this budget and also I should mention the income splitting measures that we put in for seniors. It's really uh, helped a lot of people who grew up in a generation where the single, uh, single income family was the norm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.